Good afternoon and welcome to our January corn and soybean outlook webinar. I'm Jim Minter, professor and director of the Center for Commercial Agriculture here at Purdue. And joining me today are my colleagues, Dr. Nathan Thompson, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Ag Economics here at Purdue, and Michael Langemeyer, who's a professor and the associate director of the Center for Commercial Agriculture. So we want to start off by talking a little bit about the reports that USDA released yesterday afternoon. And, and uh, those are pretty interesting. Um, USDA has given us a number of surprises in recent months. And this was another case of uh, things coming in a little more optimistic from a price standpoint and a little more negative from a production standpoint than expected. So if you look at the numbers, uh, the USDA reduced the corn yield again, down 3.8 bushels per acre versus December. That brings it down to 172 uh, per acre on a national yield level. And if you look at what that means, whoops, uh, that brought the production estimate for the 2020 crop down to 14.18 billion bushels. That's a 2.2% decline compared to where we were 30 days ago. And if you look at those production estimates that USDA has issued going back to last summer, you know, back in June when we were still thinking about trend line yields and didn't actually know the acreage, uh, we were talking about the possibility of a 16 billion bushel crop. In July, after the acreage report came out uh, and some concerns about yield, but still looking at pretty close to trend line, uh, thinking about 15 billion bushel crop. And then truthfully, since August, it's been coming down, right? In August, we were at almost 15.3 billion bushels. And here in January, all the way back to 14.18 billion bushels. So if you think about it, it's been a big change in production, especially given the fact that this really wasn't a short crop year in the sense that we didn't have a major weather event that really reduced uh, production levels. So uh, continue to pull those supply numbers down and leading to some tighter uh, supply estimates with respect to going carryover going into the upcoming year. Uh, looking at some of the other forecasts, USDA did reduce their export forecast by 100 million bushels compared to where they were back in December. So they're at 2.55 billion bushels. And that was really a function of them reducing the uh, export forecast based on the idea that higher prices were going to limit a demand in some of those importing countries. Um, if you take a look at the exports, the actual shipments uh, that have taken place, looking at the weekly data that comes from the Foreign Ag Service, so far this year through the end of December, total corn exports are up 72% compared to last year. Now that doesn't look quite as good as you go back to the 2018 or the 2016 crop years, but nevertheless compared to last year up 72%. And the rise in exports to China by itself accounts for about 80% of the increase relative to last year. So that gives you an idea as to how important what's going on in China is relative to not only the soybean market, but also the corn market. And of course, that's very heavily tied to the rebuilding of the Chinese uh, hog herd as they continue to attempt to recover uh, from African swine fever. Um, USDA did become a bit less optimistic about ethanol usage than they were in December. They pulled back their uh, estimate for the quantity of corn going into ethanol production back to 4.95 billion bushels. That's only slightly above where it was for the 2019 crop year. And if you look at what's going on in the ethanol market, you can see why. Uh, this is the data from Iowa State University where they estimate the daily ethanol plant margins. This is the return over operating cost per gallon of ethanol produced. And you can see those margins look pretty good in late October, early November. Uh, but since that time have come down pretty steadily and, and recently have been pretty close to zero. If you look at the ethanol production numbers, this is from the US Energy Information Agency and compare it to the same week a year earlier uh, for a good chunk of the fall, Production numbers on a, on a weekly basis were running between four and 5% below a year ago. But more recently, uh, it's been over 10% reduction. In fact, the last couple of weeks of December, uh, about a 12% reduction in ethanol production on a year to year basis. So weak ethanol production suggests, uh, and, and weak gasoline prices suggest that uh, uh, continue to struggle there. And, and I wouldn't be surprised to see USDA pull back their ethanol number one more time. Um, on the backside, though, obviously, what they're betting on and have continued to bet on is the idea that in the latter half of the marketing year, 
we'd see an improvement in the U.S. economy and see those ethanol numbers come back. So it remains to be seen how that's going to shake out. Well, you put all that together and think about what that means for ending stocks. USDA reduced the ending stocks estimate by 150 million bushels compared to where they were in December. That brings the ending stocks down all the way to 1.55 billion bushels. And again, a little like the production numbers, if you look at the ending stocks forecast that have been issued monthly throughout the course of this marketing year, back in June, we were thinking about the possibility of ending stocks coming out of the 2020 marketing year into the 2021 marketing year of over 3 billion bushels. Then in July and August, we were in that 2.7 billion bushel range and we've continued to come down. So this estimate at 1.55 is the smallest yet. And it just, again, illustrates the dramatic change in the outlook when we're swinging that ending stocks number by over a billion bushels compared to where we were as recently as August, right? So about a 1.2 billion bushel swings just since August. If you look at ending stocks as a percentage of total usage, which is a good way to gauge the magnitude of the stock carryover from one year to the next relative to the size of the industry, which of course has, has continued to get bigger over time. That ending stocks as a percentage of usage on uh, this most recent report at 10.6%. That's not all the way back to where we were in 2013, but it is pretty close and kind of leads to the, ask the question is, are we in, is there one more surprise out there? Because if there is, um, that would put us pretty much at the 2013 level. And that 2013 is, is really of interest when you look at the marketing year average prices that USDA is forecasting. They're, they raised their marketing year average price forecast 20 cents a bushel on this report to $4.20 a bushel. Go back and look at 2013, that's when we averaged 446, and you have to think that that's a potential target with respect to where this marketing year average price could wind up if we continue to see some strength, if we continue to see uh, uh, strong demand, both in the export channels uh, and domestically. So Nathan, you've uh, liked to think about whether or not we should continue to store. Uh, you've taken a look at that data. So let's take a look at that. Yeah, so a lot of folks have probably, you know, made some sales here in January and are kind of wondering, you know, what should we do with what we have left uh, in the bin as far as some marketing strategies. And so, uh, I think just walking through some some kind of simple things as far as what's going on and, and maybe thinking a little bit about what to expect going forward can be helpful. So what we have here, uh, the line up on the screen is uh, cash forward contract bids for uh, an elevator here in central Indiana. <clears throat> and so you can see, you know, those aren't, um, don't have a strong upward pattern kind of flat there uh, across the rest of the marketing year. And what it's useful to do is to compare that to uh, some kind of uh, implied break evens, so to speak, as far as you know, uh, what it's going to cost me to store the grain. And so the first line here that I want to put up is um, kind of the current bid um, plus um, uh, an on-farm storage cost of one cent per bushel per month and an opportunity cost at a 6% annual rate. And so you can see the gray line there is that kind of implied break even. So what that means is, you know, if you're going to uh, forego selling corn uh, for five dollars and thirteen cents uh, in February of this year, you know, what would you need to get <clears throat> in order to offset that on-farm storage costs? And again, the, the assumptions we've made here are kind of um, uh, would vary from farm to farm. So you need to think about what your kind of cost structure would look like. But if you're going <clears> to <throat> pass that um, uh, $5.13 up in February, and you wanted to store into, say, July here at the end of the chart, you know, you'd need to sell that grain for $5.31 a bushel in order to offset the cost that you've incurred to store, right? Uh, and another way to think about this is there might be some folks that have some grain in, in commercial storage. And so I've got another line that we'll throw up here. So this light gold line that just came up is that same sort of implied break even <clears throat> for a commercial storage scenario. And again, that's going to vary from individual to individual, but uh, I've, I've just put in a, a placeholder of four cents per bushel per month for that commercial storage. And so again, you can see that if you're going to pass up that uh, $5.13 in February, for grain and commercial storage, you're going to need to sell that for nearly $5.50 a bushel just to offset the, the commercial storage costs and the opportunity costs. And so as you're thinking about, you know, how, how to um, market the grain that you do have left here over the rest of the marketing year, 
Um, these these uh, two lines, these implied uh, break-evens for on-farm and commercial storage, give you a little bit of a, a way to think about a structure or a framework for thinking about, you know, what, what is it that you're looking to get out of uh, holding onto that grain? Yeah, that's a good point, Nathan. If you think about it, I, it's always instructive for me to think about what we would have to achieve later in the marketing year to equilibrate what we're receiving or could receive if we sold today. And that 549, if you're still dealing with commercial storage, uh, kind of catches my eye and, and you really have to think about whether or not you really think that's likely going forward. So very interesting to think about. We'll talk a little bit more about marketing strategies a little later in the program, but uh, we'll want to think about this chart some more. Yeah, so uh, the first thing I want to do after we've kind of put that into context is just think about the future side of things. And so uh, for the last couple of months, we've been talking about um, spreads between futures contracts and what, what is the carry in the market, so to speak. And, um, you know, there really hasn't been much going on here the last couple of months. Um, the, the, the structure of the futures market has been relatively flat, meaning that those deferred contracts are, are trading for uh, either below or equivalent to what the nearby is trading for instead of the positive kind of stair step uh, uh, structure that we would expect to see in a normal year. Uh, and so really, instead of uh, uh, reiterating that point again, I thought it would be useful to just take a step back and think about you know, what we've seen in the futures market. And again, people are aware of this, but I just want to kind of put some context to it as we think about some of the strategies that, that Jim mentioned. And that is, you know, this is March 2021 uh, corn futures from October through yesterday. And so you can see, obviously, we, we know that we've had, uh, based on, you know, the, the supply um, conditions that Jim just went through as far as you know, what we've seen in, in the USDA reports, you know, we've gone from somewhere in the ballpark of three dollar and seventy cents, three dollar and eighty cents uh, futures price for corn up to now over five dollars. You know, five dollars and thirty cents uh, around there this morning, right? And so we've seen a huge shift, uh, and that's had big implications for kind of um, returns that folks have maybe already accumulated in terms of stored grain, and then also implications as we think about going forward. So the other basis. Yeah, the other side of this, so that's the future side, right? Uh, the other side of this is basis, which is really important to think about. And so um, here's a chart from the Center for Commercial Agriculture's Crop Basis Tool, which anybody can access on the Center for Commercial Ag's homepage. And uh, as kind of just a reference here, I have uh, corn basis, uh, nearby corn basis for North Central Indiana. Again, the, the tool lets you look at um, any crop reporting district region uh, across Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and Michigan. So here, this is just kind of a reference, and you can see that that core basis has has tracked pretty well the black line current current year. So that's 2020, 2021 um, nearby corn basis has tracked well with the blue line, and the blue line is the the historical nearby three year average um, for that region. And so we can see that it, it's tracked pretty well with that uh, historical average. Um, which, which is not too surprising. I think as we look forward, the question that, that folks have is, all right, well, what's going to happen with basis over kind of the rest of this marketing year? Uh, and, you know, uh, I think that in, in the near term, I think the question is with the big future futures rally that we saw yesterday, um, will, will cash prices be able to keep up with that? And, and by looking around, I think at least um, in the central part of the state where I kind of pay attention, I, I would expect that basis to maybe uh, tail off a little bit or flatten out a little bit here in the near, near term. Uh, as far as what's going to happen maybe in the longer term as we look out uh, into the, the late spring, early summer months, you know, the, the, the blue line here, the historical average is what we generally use uh, as an expectation. But again, um, you know, we've talked about this on the webinars before, forecasting basis as we get out into that late spring, early summer timeframe can become quite difficult. The, the accuracy of predicting that can be quite difficult. And there's a number of reasons for that as you think about what's going on that time of year in terms of old crop and new crop and, and the transition there um, and, and kind of what, what the market is needing to do to adjust uh, prices. And so, you know, as you, as you look further out, you need to think about kind of what, what's going on there. And I think part of the story there is going to be where you're at. And so if you flip to the next slide, Jim, the, the one way to kind of show that is uh, this is the nearby corn basis in Southwest Illinois. And uh, I, Southwest Illinois is a little bit of an arbitrary selection in the sense of, as you look across Southern Illinois and Southern Indiana, you really have seen a pretty similar trend to what you see on this chart. And what you can see is the black line, that current year's basis has, has been a little bit volatile uh, in, the, in the 
last latter part there of, of 2020 with a big dip there in the beginning of November, but has recovered strongly and, and is, is really showing uh, a pretty strong basis here, kind of where we're at currently. And so again, the question is, you know, as you look forward and you think about what's going on, I think where you're at is going to depend uh, uh, a little bit on what you would expect to see out of basis. And so obviously uh, those, those southern regions along those river markets are probably a little more export dr driven. And so if we expect to see exports remain strong, uh, then, then we would probably see that basis maybe stay above that historical three-year average. Uh, as opposed to uh, places uh, maybe uh, away from the river. So again, you know, we historically think about ethanol demand being a big, uh, a big deal in a lot of those Eastern Corn Belt states. Well, you just showed the charts, you know, what's going on with ethanol and the uncertainty associated uh, with COVID and, and what that might look like as we go into the, the remainder of the crop marketing year. So Nathan, as you look at the corn basis charts, you know, both of these charts should suggest from a historical standpoint, some strength showing up until about the end of March. And then when you get past March uh, and get into April and May, you know, things become a little more uncertain, right? And, and so I think that speaks to us in terms of marketing strategy, because probably what's going on there in, in many years is the uh, uncertainty uh, associated with uh, the new crop production, right? So that starts to have an influence on basis as we move into the planting season. And so from a risk management standpoint, you want to be aware of that and, and think about the basis uh, strategy in terms of locking in some attractive basis levels, because uh, particularly for the southern part of the state uh, and southern regions, these are pretty attractive, right? Yeah, I mean, you can see there that we've got you know relatively strong basis. We already covered the fact that we know that we have strong futures prices right now and combined those, those offer some really, really favorable, attractive kind of cash price opportunities, folks. For folks, and again, I, I agree. I think that as we look over the near term, um, you know, we would expect to see basis remain strong. But as you move through that kind of uh, spring time frame, and we get closer to the planting season, you know, we don't really know. Basis kind of can get a little bit volatile, going one way direction or the other, uh, based on what we see happening with that new crop production. <clears throat> so this is a, a, an interesting chart that I put together just to kind of give us some context for what we've seen here over the last several months at the, the beginning of, of this crop marketing year from harvest uh, till now. And so what, what we're looking at is uh, net returns to a speculative storage strategy, meaning you just um, harvested grain, put it in the bin, you didn't take any position. Um, and so you're, you're speculating on both the futures price as well as the basis. Uh, and I, I've looked at that for kind of two um, uh, time frames, so to speak, over uh, uh, the last 30 or so years. And so the gold bar is kind of this first time frame. And so that would be in each of those years, if you had put grain in the bin in October uh, and then sold it in January, that would be the net return above the storage cost uh, associated with, with that strategy. And if you look at 2020, you can see the gold bar there for that strategy uh, it's a dollar and 27 cents. And so this year, if you had put grain uh, in the bin in October of 2020, and you were to sell it today for what cash prices are today, you would have netted uh, a return of a dollar and 27 cents per bushel. And if you look, you know, that gold bar there in 2020 is, it, it just dwarfs any other year that we, we see on this chart here. The gray bars add some context to that number in the sense of a strategy where you would store that grain uh, from October through the following May. And so obviously in 2020, we haven't experienced what that's going to be yet, but, but I put those bars up there to give you some context of maybe where this could be going. And I wouldn't say that the gold bars are necessarily predictive of the gray bars on the chart, but you, it does give you some context of we've seen years with, with these large returns to a speculative storage strategy for corn. They're not super frequent. We, we've talked about that before uh, in the workshops that we've done. But they do happen, and this clearly has turned into, at least at this point, one of those years that has some pretty exceptional returns associated with that uh, speculative storage strategy. Because again, there's no there's no ceiling on that. As, as much as futures can rally, which we've seen them do, and then on top of that, this year we have strong basis as well, which is really playing in uh, to that really strong return we've seen up to this point in the year. So it's really interesting, Nathan. I think you look at the chart. There's a couple things that kind of jump out at me. One is uh, we've talked about this when we uh, conduct a, a number of marketing workshops over the last couple of years, and that is that 
speculative storage into late December, early January, uh, year in and year out is a pretty good strategy. And this, this chart kind of confirms that. Mm -hmm. um, usually doesn't generate the kind of returns we're seeing this year, but nevertheless, it's been a pretty, pretty low risk kind of a strategy. And the second one is, as you look at it, um, you know, there's only three years on that chart where their total returns going out to May uh, exceeded what we've already seen here in January. And that kind of leads me to say, well, you know, if you're thinking about what to do with the remainder of your uh, crop that you've got in storage, and you haven't sold any here at these relatively high prices here recently, you probably ought to think about selling some, right? Um, yeah, no, I, I... Go ahead. I would say I, I, I completely agree with that. I think that that's, that's neat. That, that would be my recommendation as far as the strategies. We think about grain that you still have in the bin looking forward over the next several months is a little bit of a, a you know, divided up uh, in the sense of, you know, you, you certainly don't want to forego what, what we're seeing currently in terms of, of uh, pricing opportunities. But if you, if, if you uh, have the risk tolerance and, and you, you have a, a bullish outlook here over the next uh, few months, and you want to allocate a little bit uh, to kind of spread out over that time frame. You know that, that would leave some upside potential for you, but just realize that, that there's obviously downside risk associated with that. And again, very specifically, you know, really think about the time frame. You know, going out beyond say May. You know, our research shows that there's a lot more downside after that point in the year uh, than there is here in the next couple of months. And I think the key point is to think about your marketing strategy from a risk management perspective. You know, I think one thing that some of the charts that we've already shown today help illustrate is how difficult it is to really forecast what's going to happen. And if we're honest about it, we don't know what's going to happen to prices here over the next several months. And uh, there is clearly some opportunity for prices to continue to improve but there's also a substantial amount of downside risk, uh, particularly as you get a little later into the spring and we start thinking about the impact or possible impact of new crop uh, conditions. So, you know, the idea of splitting up your remaining inventory and, and allocating a portion of it to current sales, uh, maybe a, a, another portion in a few weeks and kind of al allowing it to literally kind of dribble out over the next several months might be a reasonable strategy that will generate some pretty positive returns for that 2020 crop. And I think that's what we need to kind of come back to. And I know Michael Langemeyer will kind of revisit that with us here in a little bit, but uh, those are some of the key points. We'll kind of discuss that a little more later on. Let's turn our attention to soybeans. Uh, USDA also reduced the soybean yield estimate um, this time by a half a bushel per acre. That doesn't sound like much, but uh, in an environment where we already had a pretty tight supply situation, that's enough to make a difference. That yield reduction pulled down the crop size for the 2020 crop by 35 million bushels to 4.14 billion bushels. At the same time, USDA bumped up the soybean export forecast by 30 million bushels to 2.23 billion bushels. That would be the largest uh, soybean exports on record. And if you look at soybean exports, uh, looking at the, or using the weekly data from the Foreign Ag Service, um, actual soybean exports so far this year up 78%. And the rise in exports to China accounts for all of that increase. In fact, maybe just a little bit more than that increase uh, going to China. So clearly what's taking place in China with respect to increasing demand related to the rebuilding of their hog herd is having a huge impact on uh, both corn and soybean prices. Uh, that's the good news, but that also suggests there's some risk out there as well. And uh, one of the cha challenges there is, is trying to figure out, you know, just how large is the Chinese hog herd today? Uh, there's been some statement coming uh, out of China suggesting that they have rebuilt their herd, got it back basically to 2017 levels. Um, that is a larger uh, number than what USDA is currently uh, indicating that the size of that hog herd might be. I think the bottom line is none of us really know exactly how large the hog herd is in China, uh, but it's clearly made a big difference. But uh, whether or not we're going to continue to see um, these kind of increases in exports to China going forward uh, is, is really an open question, uh, particularly on a seasonal basis. You know, normally uh, exports uh, from the U.S. are dominant uh, this time of year up until about February. And as you get into February, uh, the world starts to turn its attention to the South American crop. 
and that's going to be a big factor uh, coming up here over the next uh, 30 to maybe 60 days. If you look at the numbers that USDA released uh, yesterday, uh, they did pull back their estimate for Argentine production by about 2 million metric tons. They left their estimate for Brazil unchanged. And I know a lot of people in the trade think that that's too optimistic. There are lots of numbers floating around the trade suggesting Brazilian production could be less than what USDA is forecasting. 30 days from now, we'll probably know a lot more about that as the, as the Brazilians start to harvest more, uh, but that's that's up in the air. They did raise China's imports, expected imports, by a little over 2 million metric tons. And again, a lot of people think in the trade that that might be too low, that we might see even larger exports to China on a worldwide basis. Um, so a lot of uncertainty there with respect to uns uh, South American production and also some uncertainty with respect to exports to China. If you look at the soybean ending stocks forecast uh, that USDA issued going all the way back to June, and really in this case, I think probably the, the most interesting one is to start with August. In August, on the WASD report in, in mid-August, we were expecting a carryover from the 2020 crop into the 2021 crop year of over 600 million bushels. That is now down to 140 million bushels. Um, that's the smallest carryover, I think, since 2013. And I think some people would probably argue that at 140, we're getting pretty darn close to pipeline supplies. In other words, it's hard to pull that carryover down much more than that. Uh, anything more than that would suggest you simply need to ration with respect to higher prices. Um, if you look at ending stocks as a percentage of usage, we're down to 3.1%. Um, that's the tightest it's been since 2013 when it was 2.6%. Uh, and if you look at the change over these last two years, I mean, it's, it's phenomenal, right? Two years ago, we were at 23%, last year at 13%, and now down to just over 3%. That 2013 comparison is kind of important. Uh, again, a little bit like corn, USDA did bump up their marketing year average pretty substantially by 60 cents a bushel on this report to 1115. If you go back to 2013, though, the marketing year average was $13. And it suggests to me, again, a little like corn, that that 13 might be a possible target in terms of where we might be headed with respect to a marketing year average, if not all the way to 13. I would not be surprising to see that marketing year average rise above that 1115 that USDA currently has. And then finally, I think it's important to not only think about what's going on in the US, but also on the world basis. And world stocks levels are also pretty close to those that we observed back in 2013. In fact, on the soybean side, they're about the same, 23%. Corn, we are, <clears throat> excuse me, slightly larger at 25% versus 23% in 2013, but still relatively close. So not only are stocks tightening at the U.S. market level, but also on a worldwide basis, suggesting uh, we're going to continue to see relatively strong prices. So, my, uh, Nathan, you've kind of taken a look at the same kind of information except on soybeans that you looked at on corn. Yeah, so just taking a look at the, the soybean side of things. So again, the first line here that you're seeing um, is just forward contract bids for soybeans uh, here over the rest of the marketing year. Again, those are pretty flat and, and the underlying reasons for that is, is gonna be you know, um, the, the lack of carry in, in the futures market and then also um, pretty flat basis bids over here uh, for, for the rest of the marketing year that, that are built into those forward contract bids. But probably the more useful part of this exercise is to think about, okay, how do those bids compare to kind of these uh, implied uh, break-even uh, prices for, for storage? What would you need to sell grain for in order to offset those storage costs? And so the, the gray line that you're seeing now is uh, that, that kind of implied break-even for an on-farm storage scenario. And again, just briefly, that our assumption here is one cent per bushel per month in on-farm storage costs and then a 6% annual percentage rate for opportunity costs. And so again, you can see that, you know, if you're foregoing a $14.36 bid in February uh, and you're looking at holding on to that grain, you know, if you're going to hold on to it out into June, July, you know, you can see those prices out there that you would need to be expecting in order to, um, uh, to, to break even on, on that decision to, to wait in store. So $14.69 and $14.77 out there uh, in those early summer months. And then the next line here is, is again, a commercial storage kind of scenario where the storage cost uh, is bumped up from one cent per bushel a month to four cents. 
And so again, foregoing kind of those, those bids that we're looking at here uh, over the next couple of months, 14, 20, 14, 30, you know, you get out into July in a commercial storage scenario, you're looking at a needing to sell grain for, for $15 a bushel. So sell soybeans for $15 a bushel to offset that, that commercial storage cost. And so, you know, again, just, just giving you a framework or a, a little bit of a <clears throat> uh, target to think about you know, do, do you think that $15 soybeans are out there this summer or not? And that should drive a little bit what you're expecting to do here over the next couple of months. Yeah, Nathan, I always think it's instructive to think about what it would take to equal the price I'm offered today at some point in the future. And, and as you pointed out, it's going to depend on the individual because different people can have different cost structures depending on whether or not they're borrowing money, using their own money to operate, whether or not they're in commercial storage or on farm storage. But nevertheless, uh, those costs continue to accumulate and, and it can be pretty substantial when you start looking at commercial storage. Yeah. And again, here, we're just looking at uh, March 21 soybean futures. And again, um, you know, we've been showing the, the uh, future uh, soybean futures carry the, the spreads between futures contracts. And, and again, those haven't changed. And so I, I, I didn't want to put those up here, but I do want to just mention, you know, those there remains to be kind of inversion in that soybean futures market, uh, meaning that those more deferred contracts are trading uh, for less than the nearby. But what is kind of instructive as we think through uh, some of the, the slides that are going to come up here in a second is what, what we've seen happen in, in the soybean futures market. And so you can see that March 21 soybean futures were trading for, you know, in the ballpark of $10, maybe a little higher than that back in October. And, you know, we've seen a rally of over $4 a bushel in, in, in the soybean market. So we're trading, you know, today a little lower than what I'm showing here, but uh, 410 or so. Uh, excuse me, 1410, $14.10. And so, you know, that's, that's a pretty remarkable rally in that period of time. And again, that has implications for kind of what we've seen in terms of some potential returns to, to grain that people have, have stored for this uh, crop year. And so again, the other side of, of the price equation, the cash price equation here is our basis. And so uh, I want to take a few minutes just to talk about uh, some things going on with soybean basis. So we've been saying, you know, uh, all fall, that soybean basis has, has been strong across the, the Eastern Corn Belt states that we track in the, the Center for Commercial Ag's crop basis tool. And so you can see that uh, again here with the black line representing uh, soybean basis, in this case in North Central Indiana in the 2020-2021 crop marketing year. The blue line there is the, the two-year average uh, nearby basis in that same region. And so you can see, you know, we're currently um, at least, let's see, 30 cents above um, the, the historical average there. So you know, really strong basis. And, and that's been the case uh, for, for most of this crop marketing year. Um, and then again, the question kind of is, you know, what, what do we expect to see going forward? You know, the research that we've done, you know, as you look at longer time horizons. So if you look out into say three, four months into the future, uh, the research says that, that that basis is likely going to revert to the mean. And the, the task that we have to do is kind of interpret that through the lens of what we know about what's going on this year. And so, um, you know, the question is, will we see that, that reversion to the mean or uh, will we see that continued strength? And I don't think any of us know for sure, um, but, but the, the, the thing to keep in mind is that as, after we get past that May timeframe, you know, as we talked about with corn and we get new crop conditions coming into play, that can get really volatile moving in one direction or the other. And so, you know, as you're thinking about strategies here over the next couple of months, I, I would incorporate that continued strength and soybean basis into any sort of expectations that you're building. You know, as you get later on in the season there, uh, it becomes a little bit harder to figure out and you need to realize both the upside potential in basis. We talked about that on, on last month's webinar a little bit, as well as the downside risk. Um, and so um, just, just kind of keep that in mind. You know, Nathan, if you look at the chart, and I think some of the other charts that you've looked at and some of the other research that you've looked at, you can expect uh, with some degree of confidence, some additional or relatively strong basis, I, I should say, uh, up through that late winter time frame, maybe the beginning of spring. So looking at the chart, basically towards the end of March. As you get into April, a little bit like corn, and then in obviously May and, and uh, July, uh, May, June, July, basis forecasting becomes very risky. And right. the later you go in the period, the riskier it becomes because it becomes more heavily dependent on what's taking place with respect to new crop, right? 
Yeah, exactly. That that's that's the thing to keep in mind. So you know, as you're looking over the next couple of months, I, I would certainly expect it to kind of uh, continue to have some strength. Obviously, you want to pay attention and, and see what's going on. Uh, but after that, it just becomes a lot harder to know for sure, uh, one way or the other. So here, this is just a, a, another chart to kind of give some context to the fact that you know basis is very much a regional concept and varies uh, uh, depending on where you're at. And so again, here I'm looking at Southwest Illinois, uh, which really is is just an example of, of what's going on kind of across the, the southern parts of Illinois and Indiana along that river market. And so again, you know we we started out with, with strong soybean basis in that region as well. We did see it bounce around a little bit there in the fall with, again, a similar dip uh, in that basis in the beginning of November uh, as what we saw for corn. But again, since then, we've seen that strengthen uh, you know, quite a bit in, in nearly um, for Southwest Illinois here, we're you know, at almost 25 cents over um, the, the, uh, the March 21 futures. And nearly 50 cents, you know, 45 cents or so uh, above that three-year historical average. So again, similar to corn, you know, we're seeing obviously strong futures prices, but then on top of that, really strong basis, which is is combining to give us some, some really favorable, really attractive cash price opportunities. And again, a little bit like corn, it looks like that's being driven by export demand because it seems to be those river markets that are showing the strongest basis levels, right? That's right. So you've taken a look at the storage returns and soybeans like you did on corn. Yeah, so again, uh, the same setup here, looking at these speculative net returns for two timeframes over kind of a historical time period here. And so again, the gold line is, is uh, the, the net return to a strategy where you, you put soybeans in the bin in October and you, you were gonna sell them in January where the, the 2020 line here on the far right hand side would be, you know, if you were going to sell that grain, I think based on yesterday's cash price. Uh, and then the the gray line is that um, kind of same strategy where you're you're storing um, soybeans, put them in the bin in October, taking no position, speculating on futures and basis, uh, and you hold on till it for a sale, a cash price sale in May. And so again, when you look at this line over here, the gold line in, in 2020 of $4.19, I mean, it's just remarkable to see that you know in the last three months we've seen cash prices rally by more than that because that includes some implied storage costs um and you know you you netted a return of four dollars and 19 cents a bushel I, it's just it's 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 almost laughable to think about the size of that change and again it dwarfs anything we've seen in the, the at least the historical years that i have here in terms of um uh, uh, gross or net returns to storage for for that strategy through January. Again, when you look at it through a May time frame, so again, assuming that you were gonna hold on to the grain that you have now through, through May, uh, you can see there are obviously some other years um, where we see some pretty large uh, returns to this sort of uh, speculative soybean, soybean storage strategy, you know, 241, 361, 266 there in 2003, 2007, and 2010. And so it's not like this number is unprecedented, unprecedented from a, from a a standpoint of, of uh, different kind of uh, time frames of, of storing the, the grain. Um, but again, that 419 through January even dwarfs the, the numbers that we see there uh, for a longer time frame. And so as you're thinking about kind of, you know, where, where you're, what you're expecting to do with soybeans that you still have in the bin, don't, don't look past cash price opportunities that are there today. And similar to what we said for corn, I think that the strategy has to be you know, certainly taking advantage of, of the cash price opportunities that are there today and, and maybe trickling it out uh, a little bit uh, here over the next couple of months to kind of leave some upside potential uh, if we if there's still more upside to this market, which there very well could be. Yeah, Nathan, you know, we're, we're in uncharted territory in terms of these storage returns, right? I mean, yeah. um, we have no no evidence of any prior year in the 31 years of data that you've got on the screen there of seeing these kind of returns, particularly up to the January timeframe. And then I, the second thing I think about is, you know, is there an indication of, you know, what takes place early in the marketing year? Is that going to provide you some clue as to what's going to take place with respect to the next several months? And as I look at the chart, the answer is probably not, right? I mean, it doesn't, we don't have a strong correlation. There's not enough data really to, to make any a strong inference there with respect to the returns early in the marketing year versus what it might be later in the marketing year. But um, 
you know, from a marketing strategy standpoint, you'd really need to think about what, what are you hanging on for if, at these price levels? And obviously it's the question of whether or not we've driven prices high enough to ration demand, right? I mean, that's really the concern that we would see demand or buyers back away because prices are higher, whether they be in the livestock sector, whether they be in the export sector. Um, so that's, that's the question mark. And from a marketing strategy standpoint, um, you know, it's probably fine to hang on with some of your remaining inventories, but be careful, right? I mean, these are pretty profitable price levels and you don't want to jeopardize positive, very positive returns, much more positive than we were looking at recently uh, by, by hanging on too long. So you want to think about that as well going forward. And Michael, that uh, turns our attention to some of the numbers that you've been working on. That is uh, projections of net farm income for your West Central Indiana case farm. Uh, and you might give us a little bit of background on the case farm before you start, Michael, for those uh, for viewers that maybe aren't familiar. Yeah, this is a 3,000 acre uh, corn soybean farm in, in West Central Indiana. Uh, and, and one of the things that's very important uh, to, when we're, we're looking at this chart is the marketing strategy for this farm is to sell half before the first of the year and half the crop after the first of the year. So that really does matter uh, when you're calculating net farm income because net farm income in this chart is accrual. I also wanna talk a little bit about the government payments that we saw in 18, 19, and 20. Just to just remember uh, the 18 and 19 payments are largely related to the MFP program, market facilitation program, but there is some payments in, in 19 related to our county PLC. Uh, moving into 2020 and 2021, we're going to talk more about our county and PLC for the 21 crop uh, year, but we don't anticipate there being our uh, 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 county PLC payments uh, for the 20 crop nor for the 21 crop. And so the 20 payment, uh, that checkered bar is for the CARES Act, the first two rounds of the CARES Act. Um, it, with, with having said that, uh, when we look at 21, uh, a, a big portion of that, that, that net farm income in 21 is selling half of that 20 crop. Uh, and so that's very important. We talked, you know, uh, Nathan and Jim talked about marketing strategies uh, out, to, out until May. Uh, make sure you take advantage uh, of these good prices and, and make sure uh, that you maintain that, that strong net farm income uh, for, the, for the 20 crop. Also, uh, the, the prices for the for the uh, fall of 21 continue to improve. Uh, they're obviously not near as high as, as the as the as the corn and soybean futures prices uh, today, or for the or for, for the nearby future. But they're still relatively strong uh, compared to break even. Uh, Nathan was looking at some uh, forward contract prices: uh, 510 that would be for the 20 crop, and 4, 1425 for soybeans. The reason why these net farm income uh, 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 charts here in 20 and uh, our, our bars in 2020 and 2021 look so good is the break even for this farm is about is under four dollars for corn and under ten dollars for soybeans and so it's no wonder we're seeing relatively strong uh, net farm income in 2020 and 2021. I wanted to include this chart uh, for a couple reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, profit margins look very strong in 2020, um, which is over pretty much. Uh, there might be uh, some some adjustments a little bit to that, but that's pretty much uh, over. That the, the 2020 profit margin was was slightly above the average since 2007, so a very good year. 2021 looks even better. Uh, one of the things I want to say about that is is uh, I encourage you to. We have a pro forma. Uh, pro forma financial performance uh, spreadsheet on our website. I encourage you to take a look at that and continue to monitor what your profit margin might be uh, for 2021 because, uh, because I want you to think about perhaps making some machinery and equipment purchases. This might be the year, uh, 2021, where you replace some of that equipment uh, that you haven't been able to replace for the last several years, because certainly we got two, two, two years in a row here, pretty good profit margins. So I did wanna, did wanna say that, so keep on top of this. But I also wanted to talk, uh, turn this back over to Nathan, uh, you know, I, I, to create the, the, grad, the, the bar here for 2021, I've used, uh, futures prices, uh, the opening futures prices today. And so it's just some things we can do to preserve uh, those potential profits. Uh, and so that, that leads us to thinking about marketing opportunities for the 21 crop. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Michael. And as, as you look there at the chart and the, the projection that Michael has for, for 2021, 
in the height of that bar. I mean, it has to get your attention and have you start thinking about, because again, that projection is built off of half of that crop being sold at what the new crop is trading for today, right? And so we have the prices up there, December 21 corn, new crop, uh, 458, soybeans, 1175. Uh, and again, Michael mentioned, you know, when you compare those to the nearby, uh, they maybe don't look as favorable as what we're seeing right now. But when you look at his projection, you have to at least start thinking about you know, what, what some strategies might be surrounding that 2021 crop would be. I, I would not recommend going out and selling everything, you know, at those prices, but you got to be getting serious about thinking about making some, some potential sales or at least develop, developing some strategies around those prices. I, I know Jim mentioned earlier, you know, you, you really want to be thinking about managing risk, right? How can you uh, potentially lock in some prices uh, that you know are above your break even? And maybe even leave some upside potential if we think there's there's still some upside potential to those prices, which there certainly could be uh, over the next several months. Uh, looking forward to, to when we might see some sort of weather rally or something like that, something related to South America uh, could give a bump to these prices even more. Yeah, good point, Nathan. I think the, the key is to recognize, and uh, as we continue to indicate with some of our charts, how difficult it is to forecast what's going to happen in the future. And that's really what risk management's all about. It's recognizing the fact that you can't forecast the future with a high degree of accuracy, and therefore you've got to manage risk. And so you've got an opportunity to lock in some pretty positive returns for the 2020 crop and also start thinking about the 2021 crop. Risk management would say you should do that on at least a portion of your production, right? So. Michael, uh, you've taken a look at uh, cash rent and net returns to land as well. Yes, and one of the things I want to say here before I talk about this chart in too much detail, when you look at the 10-year average cash rent and the 10-year average net return to land, again, using that case form in West Central uh, Indiana, so using uh, cash rents for West Central Indiana and net returns to land uh, for that case form located in West Central Indiana, is we look at the 10-year averages of cash rent net return to land, it appears like we're in equilibrium uh, for, for 2020. And so, uh, and, and another thing to think about 2020 is a lot of the negotiations for cash rent uh, in, in 2021 were probably already uh, probably already occurred before the, before the before the large increase in prices. And so we don't expect a lot of upward pressure uh, for 21 cash rent, but let's talk a little bit about 2022 cash rent uh, if, if 2021 does materialize like we think it's going to, uh, in this chart we're looking at, again, of some very uh, strong net return to land for 2022, we're certainly going to see some upward pressure uh, for cash rent in 22. Uh, how much? It's, it's very difficult to predict at this point, but I... I I, I think a, a 5%, you know, up to up to 5% uh, at least uh, if, if 21 return, uh, you know, stays as strong as it, it as it appears in this chart. So, Michael, 5% would imply uh, looking at average cash rents uh, between maybe 12 and $15. Yeah. Month. And the reason why I, I, I started this by talking about that we're, we're currently in equilibrium is some people think, oh my goodness, we've seen such a large increase in net return to land. That's going to translate into $25, $50 increases in cash rent. Whoa, slow down. I mean, uh, you, you've, got to, you've got to look at also, we had several years in a row here where net return to land was, was below that cash rent. So that's why I like to talk about this relationship in terms of long run averages. Good point. Uh, this is this is uh, showing something similar. This is actually looking at the 10-year average cash rent uh, and 10-year average net return to land. Uh, what I've done to create this chart, I've taken land price divided by uh, the 10-year average cash rent, and land price divided by uh, the 10-year average net return to land, and it just brought <laughs> some point here that currently in 2020, I don't have this, I don't have a projection for 21, but in 2020 we're pretty much in equilibrium, uh, and and just uh, looking from about 13 to about 19. Uh, the the blue line or the or the price in relationship to cash rent was higher than the relationship between uh, price and net return to land. That was our downward pressure uh, in terms of cash rent. Uh, and so, unless we see larger spikes than what we're anticipating in terms of net net return to land, we're not we're not likely to see large spikes uh, in cash rent. But again, five percent is not small. Uh, but but nevertheless, we're we're not likely to see some of the increases. Uh, that we saw, uh, for example, from 2006 to 2013. 
We're not there yet. It would take it would take uh, it would take a, a two or three years in a row here, uh, including 21 of 250 to 300 dollar net return to land. And when you start looking at 2022, uh, it doesn't appear a net return to land is going to be above 250. Uh, it, it looks like it's going to be something south of that. And so. Uh, and so, and so, uh, uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, where cash rent might be heading here in the next year or two. This is really this chart has really changed since last month. Uh, you know, I've been showing this chart for the last several months. Uh, you know, looking at the net return prospects for corn and soybeans. Obviously, uh, given the large increase. And soybean prices, soybeans were quite profitable. Uh, when you look at the 20 crop year, uh, you know, compared to corn, uh, that was the case from 13 to 18. But what I want to really, what I really want to say uh, related to this chart is, look how small that red bar is uh, in 2021. And so we're certainly not in a situation like we were in 16, 17, and 18, where there was quite a few people in Indiana uh, looking at, at uh, second year soybeans. I think we're more in a situation where uh, perhaps a going back to that 50-50, you know, 50% corn, 50% soybeans makes a lot of sense uh, from an Indiana Indiana perspective because because corn is is is, is more competitive uh, than, than it was uh, than it was in 16, 17, and 18, and that's particularly true uh, given that 3.8 bushel decrease in in corn in, in 2020 uh, corn yields. I also have had quite a few questions. We've had quite a few questions related to farm bill options for the 21 crop year. Uh, this deadline is coming up March 15th, uh, 21. So make sure you sign up uh, as soon as possible. Uh, the sign up is only for the 21 crop year. And so we can, we can uh, make a different, uh, different decision for the 22 crop year. Uh, this, just a reminder, the PLC prices seem really low. Uh, you're jumping ahead of this there, uh, Jim. He wants me to speed up, I think. Uh, the PLC prices are are relatively low. Uh, you look at 370 corn, 840 soybeans. What's the chance of us getting to 840 soybeans? Not very high, uh, but that is the PLC prices. Uh, wheat, uh, the the current cash prices is is more similar uh, to 550 than uh, certainly the corn and soybean uh, you know uh, current prices compared to the PLC prices. So looking at program choices for 21, uh, our recommendations are very similar to the recommendations we made uh, for the previous two years for corn and wheat. Uh, PLC looks like a good option. Uh, there, there certainly is a chance for market year price to fall below the PLC reference price for corn uh, and particularly for wheat. Uh, and, and so that makes that makes the PLC uh, a logical choice. Uh, I've had some questions related to Arc County for corn. And unless you're expecting, uh, you know, prices to perhaps be in that 375 to 425 range and uh, very low yields. I mean, we're talking 20 20% 20, 20 below trend. I don't know why anybody would necessarily expect that. But if we had very low yields and and and, uh, and price slightly above 370, our county would look better. But but all the other price yield combinations, anything close to trend in particular, uh, PLC looks like it's going to be better for corn than our county, and certainly for wheat, uh, PLC is that's a no brainer. PLC looks like a, a more attractive program uh, for soybeans. Not likely to get a payment um, period, uh, but our county does look more attractive than PLC because of that very low reference price. So, Michael, just a couple of things for people to make sure you're aware of. One is that deadline is coming up pretty quick, uh, quick by USDA standards. It's a relatively short sign-up period for this program. It expires the same time when we have to make the decisions for crop insurance. And I think that was intentional on the part of USDA. They wanted those two dates to line up. And then the second point is, um, and we've had some questions on this, the sign-up is for 2021 only. You'll have an opportunity to revisit this a year from now with respect to the 2020, excuse me, 2022 crop, and then subsequently for the 2023 crop. So it's not a multi-year decision. It's a one-year-at-a-time decision, uh, which makes it a lot easier. Those multi-year decisions are always a little more challenging, but the one-year decisions are a little more straightforward. And this one looks pretty straightforward. And as you indicated, our recommendations really haven't changed from what we told people to do last year, at least in most uh, situations or most, uh, for most uh, individuals. And uh, I think you and I agreed we're gonna post something on the website uh, in addition to the slide deck. So, but it's gonna be pretty short uh, and just sum up what we just said, said here. So that'll be up on the website here in the next few days. So, 
So with that, we're going to wrap up our program for today. Our next Crop Outlook webinar is coming up uh, the day after USDA releases the February WASD report, which will be on February uh, 10th. The WASD comes out on February 9th, and our webinar will be on February 10th. Uh, the details for that will be available on our website, purdue.edu slash commercial ag. And so with that, I want to thank you uh, for joining us today. And on behalf of my colleagues, Michael Langemeyer and Nathan Thompson, I'm Jim Minnert on behalf of the Center for Commercial Agriculture. Good day.